E658, lecture 13. So, during the last lecture, we were trying to get okay, voltage gain and the basic idea was to take a capacitor which is some charge on it which is proportional to the input and somehow transfer that same charge onto a smaller capacitor. So, if you have the same charge on a smaller capacitor, then it follows that the voltage across that smaller capacitor must be much large. This fluid analogy is very useful in understanding what happens. So, you take uh, a bucket with a large area, pour some amount of water in it. The height of water in the bucket is analogous to the voltage across the capacitor. You take that water and pour it into a bucket with a small cross section area. The height of the water is much larger. If uh, voltage is analogous to height, you find that the voltage across the capacitor is high. Basically, we are trying, uh, trying to figure out how to transfer charge from one capacitor to another. To understand that, let us take the simplest case that we can think of. We have a capacitor C1 charged to a voltage V1. This is connected to a capacitor C2 which was initially uncharged. So, I momentarily short this switch and open it again. The moment I short the switch, what happens to uh, the voltage on C2? V2 final is what? How do I compute V2 final? Charge conservation. So, when I short the two capacitors, the voltage across the two capacitors must be the same, which means that C2 plus C1 times V final must be equal to charge initially present which was C1 V1 which means that V2 I will uh, V final is simply C1 V1 by C1 plus C2. So, the final voltage is uh, clearly not the same as the initial voltage. More importantly, the charge on C2 is nothing but C2 times C1 V1 by C1 plus C2. It is simply the capacitance times the voltage. What do you see? You see that that is nothing but the initial charge which is C1 V1 times C2 by C1 plus. So, what is this equation telling you? What was the initial charge? What was the charge on capacitor C1? It was C1 V1. And that in an attempt to transfer this charge into another bucket of charge, we connected the other bucket across this C1. And lo and behold, we saw that some of the charge is indeed transferred onto C2. C2 is initially uncharged. Now, there is some charge on it. However, what do you notice? The, uh, we wanted to get the entire charge transferred. However, only a fraction of the charge C1 V1 is getting transferred onto C2. The fraction of charge on C1 getting transferred is C2 by C1 plus. Now, if you want to suck out the entire amount of charge from C1. When is that possible? Look at this equation. So, it, the only way in which you can suck out the entire charge in C1 is to make C2 much, 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 much larger than C1. In principle, you will be able to suck out the charge from C1 onto C2 only if C2 is infinite. In the bucket analogy, the only way in which you can drain out a bucket completely by connecting it to another bucket is you had a bucket like this with some water in it and you had another bucket and what are you doing where you connect the two together? What you are doing is you know putting a pipe between these two buckets at the bottom what happens? Water flows in and reaches the same level in both the buckets. The only way in which you can drain out the entire water here is when this bucket is 
is the ocean, right? For any finite size of the bucket, you will find that you will not be able to drain out all the water. Now, this is a problem simply because, I mean, physically implementing infinite capacitance is not possible. Correct? So, what do you think I can do? I mean, last time uh, in the analog circuits class, we know that you can always take a capacitance and use the Miller effect for which I will refresh your mind if you have forgotten, is to take an amplifier of gain A and then put a capacitor of value C2, in which case what is the capacitance looking in? It is A plus 1 times C2. So, even though you have only a puny little capacitor C2, by putting it in feedback around a voltage controlled voltage source with a very very large gain, which you know how to do, you can make it look like a very very large capacitor. In principle therefore, if A tends to infinity, then the looking in capacitance will look like infinite. C1 and I just take this diagram here and then twist it around a little bit. So, how will that look? So, which must be minus, which must be plus? The plus must be grounded. This is C2. Let us assume now that the uh, that we are indeed uh, competent enough to build an amplifier with a gain infinity. The moment I close the switch, all the charge from C1 must get onto this infinite capacitor. Okay, this contraption which is shown in this green box. So, when I open the switch again, what there is, is a, this capacitor C2 and somewhere on this infinite capacitor there is charge sitting. And how much charge is sitting? C1 V1. So, if you have this box and charge is sitting somewhere, where can it sit? You know that the input impedance of the amplifier is infinite, it is a voltage controlled voltage source and charge has to sit somewhere, it can only be sitting on the top and bottom plates of the capacitor C2. What does this mean? The charge is C1 V1, correct? The capacitance value is C2. So, what is the voltage across this capacitor? Simply the voltage across the capacitor V2 is nothing but the charge divided by the capacitance which is C1 by C2 times V1. Now, what is the voltage of the output of the amplifier. When I short these two going by our infinite capacitor analogy, this guy in the green box is an infinite capacitor. When I short the two, what is the final potential? When I have an infinite capacitor, the final potential must be 0. So, the moment I close this switch, this potential will go to 0. When I open the switch, the potential will remain 0. So, this potential is 0, the voltage across this capacitor is C1 V1 by C2. So, the output voltage is minus C1 V1 by. Now, let us uh, draw the circuit. So, if I want to sample an input, one simple minded way of doing it is do on phi 1 you sample the input. Correct? On phi 2, I connect it to this infinite capacitor C2. This is V out. Uh, go through this uh, step by step. The first time I shot phi 1, C1 holds C1 times V in, 
then I open 5 1 then close this switch so all this charge actually gets onto this capacitor so the voltage is minus C2 by C1 times V before I when I am sampling the next input what should I do should I what should I do to this charge on C2 should I leave it like that or I have to discharge this, uh, this uh, capacitor because if I didn't discharge that capacitor the next time the voltage on that capacitor will be not corresponding to the input in the second cycle but also will have something corresponding to the previous input can you suggest what I should do I should discharge this capacitor so what should I do this is C2 yeah so when should I do that the output is valid in phi 2 so what I should do is short the capacitor C2 in phi does it make sense you can see basically that this whole circuit here has got only what switches capacitors and op amps okay, so this is a very very simple example of a whole family of analog circuits which are called switch capacitor circuits where the whole idea is to basically uh, play around with charge and transfer charge from capacitor to capacitor if I didn't do this process of discharging C2 every cycle what do you think will happen to the output charge will go on accumulating on C2 so you now have what is called a discrete time accumulator so the, uh, the voltage at this uh, in this cycle is not just what you had uh, uh, the, I mean, doesn't just correspond to the input you have this cycle but also remembers all the past ok so it keeps accumulating charge so this is an accumulator once you have an accumulator you can build a whole bunch of uh, filter I mean FIR and IR filters and all that stuff now simply become very very straightforward ok so just like when you built a second order continuous time filter where we had uh, you know, two integrators in a loop and then you have this damping and all that this instead of being a continuous time integrator this is a switch capacitor integrator so you can configure it put two of them in a loop and realize a switch capacitor by quad ok a second order section which uh, is analogous to a continuous time second order filter so anyway I do not want to side, uh, get sidetracked but uh, you can see that many possibilities exist so this is an example uh, uh, dot zero version of a switch capacitor amplifier where so the gain of the amplifier is dependent on ratio of capacitors ok now let us see what all problems there are with this so clearly so if I redraw it as is drawn in the textbooks this is what you get okay. so one thing you must uh, all be aware of at this point in time is that any node in a circuit will always have parasitic capacitance to to ground all right it may also have parasitic capacitance to a whole bunch of other nodes but it is always accompanied by a parasitic capacitance CP to ground any node in a circuit let us see now I mean, and, and typically the parasitic capacitance is dependent on the length of the wire that connects this node to this node ok uh, that connects to this uh, node this node and so on the only thing you can definitely say about the parasitic capacitance is that CP is hopefully small and CP is unknown a priori it depends on how you know the height of the wire above uh, 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 on an IC the height of the wire above the substrate and a whole bunch of reasons which you have hardly any control over what is the effect of CP on 
are amplifier gain. So without CP the gain was This is minus C2 by C1. With CP, yes, replace C1 by C1 by C2. Correct. So with CP, what happens to the gain? So what's the problem? The gain earlier, which was simply a ratio of capacitors, can be very well controlled when there was no CP because C1 and C2 can be made with the same kind of capacitor. So, in other words, you can get very, very accurate gains when there was no CP, okay, when the parasitic wasn't around. In practice, there is going to be parasitic at every node and this parasitic capacitance could come due to many causes. One of them is just the length of the wire. The other one is that the switch that you use, okay, is a, you know that finally it's going to be a MOS switch. When you have a MOS switch, you have depletion regions between the drain and, so, and substrate and the source and the substrate and drain and gate and all this other stuff. So all those are also parasitic capacitances. Unfortunately, those capacitances do not track these capacitances when temperature changes, for example. Okay. So uh, C2 and C1 are made with parallel metal plates. So these are different kinds of capacitors when compared to the parasitics over which you have no control. If CP wasn't around, we were quite happy because we would be able to get extremely accurate gains by making C1 and C2 with the same kind of structures. Now, the moment there is CP, there is an issue because the CP is not made of the same kind of material as C1 and C2. So, first of all, there is a gain error because of CP. The next is that it, this gain error doesn't stay constant over process and temperature because since uh, C1 and C2 are made of the same kind, if C1 varies by 10%, C2 also varies by 10%. So the ratio of C1 to C2 remains fixed. However, the moment there is CP, it will in all likelihood not vary the same way with process and temperature as C1 or C2, which is therefore a problem. The question now is, is there anything that can be done about it? In other words, basically the gain is sensitive to parasitics. The difference between C1 and CP is that you have access to the bottom plate of C1 while you have no access to the bottom plate of CP. What you can do for the time being let us neglect charge ejection and all that we will uh, do the advancing clock and all that later but in principle you have access to the bottom plate of C1 in this circuit, there is at least a hope of making it being able to distinguish the charge on C1 from the charge on CP. I mean, I am not saying that this is the answer, but there is at least a hope of being able to do better because, because you are treating C1 and CP differently. The moment phi1 is closed and opened, what is the charge on the top plate of C1? C1 V in. What is the uh, charge on the bottom plate of C1? Minus C1 V in. What is the, uh, the charge on the top plate of uh, CP? CP V in. And the charge here is minus CP V in. Okay, I will omit this bottom plate thing just to reduce clutter in the diagram. I mean, so what, what are we doing now? Uh, if we close phi 2 again, 
right so if we did this which is what we are normally going to do what happens how much charge is getting into the infinite capacitor i mean there is hardly there is no there is very little difference between these two cases in this case we are sampling v in onto c1 only if using one switch and then you are dumping the charge onto the infinite capacitor in that process you are also dumping a charge of cp times v in onto the infinite capacitor on the other hand when phi1 is closed and open what is the charge on this plate it is c1 times v in okay. and to transfer the charge on this capacitor into the infinite capacitor one way of doing it is to connect this capacitor across the infinite capacitor so i use these switches phi2 so how much charge is going into the infinite capacitor now still the same amount of charge c1 plus cp times v in is going into the infinite capacitor so now you are not doing any better than before so after phi1 what you have you have both access to both places uh, both plates of this capacitor c1 the top plate has got c1 v in the bottom plate has got minus c1 v in one way of pushing all this charge into the infinite capacitor is to simply so this is the infinite capacitor can you think of any other way of transferring charge uh, charge c1 v in into the infinite capacitor a capacitor has got two plates both the plates have got equal magnitude of charge only the sign is different okay if you are not too finicky about the uh, sign of the amplifier gain that we get it hardly matters whether you push in c1 v in or minus c1 v in if you had this capacitor whose plates were charged to the right voltage one way of transferring charge from c1 to the infinite capacitor is to do this and we found that this was sensitive to parasitics I mean, you could have uh, instead of having phi one and phi two here, you could have always connected it to ground, and you know that results in the very first case that we talked about. Another way of connecting, transferring charge is to connect the bottom plate. So you have the infinite capacitor as it is. You have phi two, and instead of connecting. the bottom plate to ground and the top plate to the infinite capacitor what i could do is connect the bottom plate to the infinite capacitor so during phi1 i have this guy during phi2 what should i do i should connect the bottom plate of the input capacitor to the infinite capacitor and connect the top plate to to ground so he, his argument is that uh, sure now this plate will have parasitic of its own okay we'll come to that later we'll come to that definitely we should come to that and see that it doesn't it's in screwing you up okay but for the time being i'll we'll figure out what happens to cp 1 so during phi 1 the charge on 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 uh, this plate on the bottom plate is minus c1 times v in okay then what do you do you take the bottom plate and connect it to the infinite capacitor and the top plate is connected to ground if i did this the charge transferred is basically minus c1 v in what happens to the charge on the uh, parasitic capacitor in cp1 it goes to ground okay we find that this arrangement is insensitive to cp1 so clearly this bottom plate will also have parasitic you see cp2 during phi1 so charge on cp2 
in phi 1 is 0 and during phi 2 Cp2 is connected to the infinite capacitor. Notice through this connection. Fortunately, there was no charge in Cp2, so it can't dump any of its charge onto the infinite capacitor. It is insensitive to Cp2. Can some charge go to Cp2? Uh, CP2? Uh, so uh, you tell me. What do you think? What do you think is the voltage? On this node in phi 2, 0. Is that clear? Why is it 0? You connected it to an infinite capacitor. So, the voltage across an infinite capacitor is always 0. Cp2 in phi 1 is connected to 0. The potential across Cp2 is 0. Alright? It just, its connection keeps getting changed from real ground to virtual ground. So, there is no charge transfer happening with regard to Cp2 at all. So, this represents a solution which is insensitive to both Cp1 and Cp2. Okay, the, I mean uh, the next question is, we have only, uh, we have only considered parasitic with respect to ground. What happens, I mean, between uh, node X and every other node Y, there will be parasitics. Okay, uh, it is true that that is, uh, if you, I mean, uh, that is in general true, but uh, you should therefore be careful to make sure that you minimize those capacitances as much as possible. Okay, I mean, you can absolutely not avoid capacitance to ground, but ca capacitance from, from what do you call node to node can be always reduced by making the nodes sufficiently far apart. Is to redraw this the way it is drawn in the textbooks, which is Right, so this is V in. If you want an amplifier, you short C2 during during uh, during phi one. If you want an integrator, you just you don't don't worry about discharging C2 every cycle. You just let it be there. Okay. So what is the gain now? It is plus C1 by C2 times Vn. Now we know that all real uh, switches have got charge injection. Now can you look at this path and tell me which switch I must turn off first? The, the bottom plate. So this switch must be the, this switch must be controlled by What clock? Slightly advanced clock. So, we control this using phi 1a. So, even though there is charge injection on this switch, I mean uh, due to the switch on C1 during the sampling phase, the amount of charge injected on C1 is independent of the input signal. Right? We have discussed this at length before. Alright? Now, let us see what happens during phi 2. During phi 2, what happens? This path is on. So, all the charge across C1 is, is dumped onto this infinite capacitor. This guy in the green box represents an infinite capacitor. You know that, right? So, when I, during phi 2, C1 is connected across this infinite capacitor. So, all the charge on C1 must get into the infinite capacitor. Then what will I do? I will open phi 2. When I open phi 2, there will be charge injection. Okay. So, do you think uh, in this particular situation, you think it's a uh, this is a problem or okay? I mean, is there any order in which I should open the switches or any order is okay? Yeah. 
this guy must be opened first. You can either open this guy first or this guy first or both at the same time. Alright, so do you think there is any particular issue with opening one? Uh, left should be slightly advanced. Why? The argument here is slightly different. One thing you can see is that the argument made is that this chap here, if you open this first, what do you think will happen? The charge in this switch and in this switch are both are both independent of the signal because both of these guys are connected to one is connected to ground, one of them is connected to virtual ground. So the charge in, in both these switches is is independent of signal. So we don't have to worry about which is open in the beginning. But there is an advantage to opening this switch first. Do you can you think why? Okay. So the this thing is that if I open this guy first, what happens? There is some charge injected onto C1. Alright? It is all the charge is signal independent, so it is not particularly a problem. But and again when phi2 is open, there is again some more charge injected onto C1, I mean C A. Dumping any charge on the left plate of C1 must be accompanied by the same increase in the right plate. So, that must come from C2. If I open the left switch first and the right switch later, I am getting hit twice. Whereas, if I open the, the right switch first, right, a small amount of the, the, some of this injected charge goes to the left and some of it goes to the right, alright. But as far as the output is concerned, it only sees that amount and that is it. Now, if phi 2 is open first, some amount of charge goes on to C1, which causes something to come from C2 and then I open phi 2. What do you think is uh, the better thing to do? Based on this discussion, what, do you, uh, what is your opinion on uh, which switch must be opened first? The one on the right. This is a, a general rule. If you look at all this, you see that the switches on the virtual ground must always be open the rule is that all the switches which connect to the virtual ground you just open them first this is a, a switch capacitor amplifier 